once I was very enthused by that life. It was something that, that replaced a life of rock and roll and going from town to town playing. Instead, I hunted books. It was, in the beginning, more thrilling. And also, one felt more noble. Now the world has, that world has passed. Mr. Ackroyd, uh, Driffield here. Um, I've got the Blake you were looking for. Don't worry, it's one of my cheaper books. 250. As soon as you send the money. Journals of David Litmanoff. I haven't heard of this. Uh, what is this? No, strictly, uh, I only look for books. I mean, I can guarantee to find you any uh, book in the world, but uh, uh, I need to have heard... It's, what do you mean, it's not a book? A typescript? Ah, oh, <clears throat> no, you'll have to apply to my deluxe service. Uh, well, it's £75 an hour, plus the charge of the book. A book is outside of time. A book, when it's read, begins to bring time into the organism when it's being read. But there's another part of it, which is the story or the material, which is another process altogether. It's not necessarily architectural. But when we've got the time that it's being read, and when we've got the non-time, which is the book, and when we've got the idea in the mind of the person who is reading it, you've got three components which are enough to make up the whole world of existence. Well, for the first time in 25 years, I'm now standing in the carpenter's arms, which I've been in since them times, and um, looking back on it, it's just like going back to the Cray days. Uh, I think I'm, I'm pretty sure to say that this is the last business I ever owned, and uh, 
going back, it's just like seeing the twins years they was then. I mean, over Saturday night here, especially Friday and Saturday night, it was more or less a night out. People would come, especially the twins, they always dressed up. It was like like another world. Um, you'd have the women out in their finery. Uh, Mrs. Cook the first had taken literally everything I had off me. And um, uh, so I got on the train, arrived at Paddington, I got two shillings max, about one and tenpence, I think. I went round to the French because I thought to myself, well, I can at least afford half, one of Gaston's half a, half a bitter, uh, because they were only one and a penny in those days. And I ordered that at the bar. Everybody said, well, haven't seen you for a minute or two. Thought she was dead. No. Well, it back. It was as if I'd never been away. So um, I was drinking this at the bar, and uh, a, a young fellow who'd been at Eton with me, by the way, came up to me and said, well, How's the old firm, Mori? I said, well, getting a bit unsteady, actually. He said, would you like a job? So I said, you bet. Uh, I thought, I don't care what it is. There's a book I'm really desperate to find. It. It's, a, it's a magical primer, 18th century, by a guy called Francis Barrett. It's incredible. It's a key to the whole area, key to the city. It's called the Magus. Jerry? Look at this. What are they? Uh, they're all sex and blades by different writers. I think Mike Moorcock wrote one of these. Really? Yeah, sure. They're good covers, aren't they? Yeah. Great. Yeah. I'm going to get these. Okay. Yeah, they're collectible. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. It's a right taxi. When we were speeding off, we picked up some other people who I found out were my future fellow directors. And uh, in the cab, I said, I wonder if anybody, since we're all going to be directors together, if somebody could lend me a fiver. So, <clears throat> which was quite a lot of money in 1960, after all. It's a fiver. Alan Peel reached his hand into his pocket, pulled out a row of notes, like 300 quid. He said, have that. So there's plenty more where that came from. And by five o'clock in the evening, I was managing director of five property companies. Well, there was one, one particular time where there was these two midgets and uh, Ron, he came in and uh, he always called it his funny night out. Um, and he put his hand behind one of their backs and pretended he was a doll, a talking doll. And, and it, the wrong sense of humour was something, it was different. I mean, he, he, he was a humorous man in his own way. And I'll never forget that as long as I live with this midget. I mean, it's just, every time I think about it, uh, it knocks me out. The only guy I know ever saw a copy was, it was in the London Library. He had a copy out, but this is very strange. He went back and they told him that the book didn't exist. I wish you'd get a move up. Uh, now, I'm also, I'm down here at the uh, Pat and Jerry. Uh, he just picked up some, 18th uh, century. Uh, some Sexton Blake, uh, Cardinal and the Corpse. And um, uh, I remember you telling me once that Flan O'Brien had uh, something to do with that. Um, I wish you'd get a move on. The lower orders down here are getting a bit up at it. Yeah, I'm improperly dressed. No, I'm not carrying my sawn-off shotgun. So what we were doing was making starts on houses and then selling them. Actually, they were only about two bricks high, see. But the company prospectuses, I mean, they were all ready to walk into. Everything there except the latchkey. So what we were doing was taking deposits on continued building. Well, see, the building never really... <clears throat> Once we took it over, some feeble start had been made by the previous administration. <laughs> that all quickly ground to a halt, and uh, no builders were ever actually contacted. We were basically working for someone called Charles the Silver, who brilliant con man. I saw him 15 days before he died, and we went we went back over all that. He said, you know, my dear fellow, he said, what fun that was. It was said that we were the first uh, mobile criminals that ever went up and down the country. The motorways opened it up. I mean, I remember the time in, in Birmingham and Manchester when, because we, came, we were companies and came from the East End, immediately a police presence came on. I mean, I stress this a lot in the book. I mean, you, you, when you go through it, I took to Blackpool and Birmingham and all that. But it, it was more like, uh, I suppose, like, it started out with something to do and then it got serious. Working for, 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 for Charles, uh, it, it wasn't like a thousand miles distant from, from, from what Ronnie, Reggie and Tony were, were, were doing, really, in a way. Uh, and there definitely must have been, whether directly or indirectly, links 
between them. I mean, just from a business point of view. Uh, I've sat there and saw a, a battle with a gun. Dangerous thing to do, man, looking back on it. But they were available, yeah, they were usable. David Litvinov, uh, uh, L-I-T-V-I-N-O-F-F, I think. Um, I'm looking for the journals uh, of him. Have you, you know him? I've never heard of him. Yeah? No, I told him I heard of him, but I don't know, I haven't actually ever heard of him, no. For me, it's a sort of form of big game hunting. Uh, that, you know, life is just a game and finding the books is uh, big game hunting. Uh, and that's the element that I, I actually enjoy. Um, I mean, it does cost a lot of money simply because uh, I have an extravagant lifestyle. Uh, all the other people, I mean, there, there's, there are other people who claim to look for books, uh, but they look, uh, they search for them. The difference is that I find them. Well, how much will they be? I'm, I'm not bothered, you know, you know, just tell me how much they be and I'll, I'll sort of uh, work it out from there. Yeah? yeah David Litvinoff was a very good friend of ours. Yeah, there was, a, there was a whole crowd of people in Chelsea. David Litvinoff was one of the main characters around there, sort of uh, rebellious aristocrats, you know, from like Lord Lampton's daughters. He was uh, in Kensington and he was knocked out and when he woke up his hair had been shaven and he was hanging outside a window. Is that to do with gambling? I think yeah. so, yeah. I don't know. No one ever knew how David got his money. He would sort of disappear and then he'd come back and he'd have loads and loads of cash on him. He ended up getting him, getting him brawled um, with one of, those, uh, one of the twins and um, some very, um, very weird throat scars, apparently, that, uh, that, 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 that he came off with. But uh, I suppose his real achievement was as uh, dialogue coach and technical advisor on the film called Performance. Um, author of, uh, author of uh, those classic lines like what a freak show, shut your bloody hole and uh, was your old man a barber, your old man was a barber wasn't he? No, no I don't think he was. No I can't remember David Limpinoff but I remember the film performance with Mick Jagger in it and uh, James Fox was it and that was roughly supposed to be about the craze and that, that it was based roughly on that performance. Uh, it had some good write-ups as it happens but I've never seen the film. I hope you're going to have an haircut after me, Jess. I will certainly be doing so, yes, yes. I always like well, Tell me something. Why, why do you have it like that? Why is it so short? It's a skin, isn't it? I call it. Well, I know it's a skinhead. Um, certainly, my major purpose is, is to show off this scar. The scar is my major achievement in life. This was the first time uh, that I ever really managed to upset somebody. I, I was sort of working uh, on a building site, and uh, I, I was just the tea boy, and I had to deliver the tea uh, to the man. And the man was wearing a hat, and he said to me, he said, uh, do you like the hat? I said, yes, it's very good. It hides your face. You know, and with that, he hit me with the wheelbarrow. I sort of woke up in hospital, but I always thought that this was a, a major achievement on my part, sort of actually wounding somebody with words. Uh, and ever since then, that was the first time I did wound somebody with words, and ever since then I've been very, very proud. But he wounded you with violence. class punter exists for, well, we all know what he exists for, don't we? I mean, you know, it's, uh, work the kite out of the pocket. It's, uh, frankly, it's that. That's the common prey, if, if, you, if you like. Listen, you've got something here that I want. There's a book. This book is the key to this whole area. The person who has this book will understand all the lines of this city lead to this door. All the lines, they lead here. I know you've got the book, you've got to let me in! What's I would it? certainly consider myself a yuppie now. You would call yourself a yuppie? Yes, yes, very much so. I'm, I'm deadly keen to be upwardly mobile. There's no limit uh, to the upwardest which I would like to be mobile. <laughs> When I came back from the war, uh, I had no home and uh, was very glad to go back to Hackney and stay with my parents for a considerable time. During the days, I spent a lot of the time walking the streets of Hackney and continued, even after I'd left the area, uh, to become a kind of ghost haunting the whole borough. 
And um, there gradually took shape in my mind the idea of a novel. I would not feel that I lived in Hackney. I would feel that I have uh, an office in deepest Dalston, which is I, the heart of Hackney. I like The Low Life because it's a London book. It's about this guy who's a Hoffman presser, and he's a gambler, and he lives in Stoke Newington in a boarding house. I don't quite know how one, how I'd end up here. What it is, uh, uh, simply that my the houses I lived in get filled up with books, and rather than move the books, I move myself, leave the books there, and move on to the next house. And so, simply, I, I sort of been doing a great circle round London. I started off in Richmond, then I sort of moved round to Acton, then I moved down to Notting Hill Gate. And as the years go, and my dream is to entirely encircle London. When he's broke, he goes to his brother and borrows money from him, and then he gets mixed up. Sort of all these gangsters and there's a chase scene at the end but it's just a great book there's six from plates by different writers well, yeah, okay i think one of them is by mike walcott i don't know yeah well walcott schmalcott very interesting uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> quidditch i mean yeah you know. okay yeah. yeah fine you were discovering a, a forgotten past, neglected past of minor people. Essentially, of course, one would love to find a G.H. Lawrence manuscript, but in Stafford that was not available, so you bought something lesser, as is thought. And that you then sold by explaining what it was to someone in some half-assed way. And and it worked. What have you got? Gerald Cash, not in the city. Oof. Hot. Ah, three quid? Five. Hello, Nigel. Yeah, um, got a knight in the city, Gerald Kirsch. Look, it's American first. Yeah. OK. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Watch out. How much is this? Uh, 50 quid. <laughs> so a lot of it is luck. I mean, are, are actually Maybe choosing the right form, the right genre, because there are respectable genres and non-respectable genres. And I think, I think Kirsch, for instance, seems, seems sort of absolutely... You know, he managed to, 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 to pick every sort of non-respectable <laughs> thing there was to write about. He wrote about working-class people, Jewish, working class people, um, unlovable Jewish working class people, and he wrote sort of about, he wrote, you know, he wrote humour, which never seems to sort of, people never seem to accept as being that respectable. There was a general reluctance um, to publish books about the East End of London. They regarded it as drab, and too uh, foreign and alien to the tastes and interests of uh, ordinary English readers. And to some extent, you can understand their attitude because we were really a, an extraordinary sort of foreign enclave, a kind of East European ghetto stuck in the middle of London. I mean, the languages that were spoken, the food that was eaten, the songs that were sung, uh, everything uh, were related to cities like Odessa, Kiev, Warsaw, Kishinev, and so on and so forth. cannot be a scavenger anymore. There's a little man in the village who knows, he's read the book, he knows it's worth £4.75. And so I don't want to go to his little village anymore. What are these? They're just sexton's late things. Yeah. I like the cupboard. To a penny, matey. I'd say I did actually find myself 1965. Uh, with a very expensive oh, girlfriend really? on my hands and uh, a very little money. So I ran to Bobby Katz and he said, well, why don't you have a go at selling books? He said, porn. I said, terrific. We were in the French. Where else? See, I mean, all my operations really started off there. <coughs> Headquartered. And so he said, right, well, come up and get started in Stan's court. I'll be interested in the other thing when you put a serious price on it. 
Well, you can have it for 40. <laughs> a serious price. <laughs> Well, the harmless stuff was all like the front, and then the heavy punishment and um, bondage and everything, uh, and, and the movies were, were all in the, in the back. Uh, we used to sort of like filter them. I've got some things you might be interested in. Flan O'Brien, originals, not recorded in the bibliography. Nobody's ever seen them, other than me. Yeah. Stephen Blakesley, uh, The Case of the Alpha Murders. The Cardinal and the Corpse, Stephen Blakesley. I, I, don't, I don't think that um, Stephen Blakesley is Flan O'Brien. I mean, categorically, I don't believe that. But, but in fact, the, the, the more I look at him, the more I think about it, the more chances are that this was a writer living in Dublin and, and submitting manuscripts, which is unusual for Sexton Blake. Most of them commissioned and from a relatively small pool of, of writers, regular writers. And I mean, the very first day I was working there, a man dashed in with blood all over him and a gun in his hand, luckily ran out again. Uh, and you've got some really quite peculiar people. I mean, so much so that at one point we had a notice. I went into work one morning, and there was a notice up behind the counter saying the following MPs will not be served. Well, there were two, M two Conservatives, two Labour. I thought, it's like a football match, two all. <laughs> it, it, it was a crazy time, I mean. There was a lot of money around. It was easy, it was open. And where you got entertainment, in, in a sense, you're going to have criminality. I, I have been uh, arrested uh, for murder, um, uh, yes. I have been known to sign the odd signature that was not my own to books that were not of my own writing, yes. I have been known to do that in public. Um, I, I've... Uh, they're probably, I would say, probably about 50% of the signed copies of most science fiction books on the market today are probably signed by me at some time. <laughs> oh, it just got a bit out of hand. You know, it's very stoned as well, sort of doing this, going in and boosting books, you know, from up in the Mayfair, the Mayfair bookshops as well. <laughs> it's just really very out of hand. Well, I got w arrested by West End Central, so... Yeah, do you remember that? That really, they really frightened me. They were horrible men. The police at that time, when they arrested me, I had no idea what was actually happening. Um, uh, and they took all my clothes for forensic evidence. And they had to bring pantechnicons to take them down to the police station. And then when eventually, uh, after about 24 hours, they did discharge me, um, that I said, you know, are you going to bring the clothes back? You know, and they sort of went, no, 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 I had to do it myself. You know, I was appalled. Driffield? Yeah? Look, 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 I've been trying to get you all afternoon. What's happening about this manuscript? Yes, of course I want it. I want it now. I want it straight away. Oh, God, what a freak show. It's a rather disturbing things that happened to some friends of mine, terminal in some cases, and I thought, well, what do I really think about all this? And that was how Derek Raymond really came about all those books, those factory books. You are money. my client. You asked me to look for the book. You owe me approximately £750. What have you done? You've employed me to look for this book for you and now you're telling me you can get it? Might be able to get it, yes. That, well, I might be able to get you a coffin. There's no, there's no need for any of this, is there? Really? What do you mean, no need? Well, look, look. Mm. It turns out that he actually owns the manuscript and he wants me to go hunting for it so I can up the price. So, you know, no, I just don't want anything to do with it. So you, you have a shady pass in this, in other words? Well, I don't consider it shady at all. I mean, you know, the, the um, uh, American government were keen to throw yeah. light on it, uh, and they failed. I mean, the government don't ask you to leave unless you've done something wrong. I mean, obviously. I didn't do anything wrong at all. Not in your eyes, I mean. No, no. no. I mean, let's, let's get down to the middle. You must have done something wrong to be thrown out of the country. Uh, officially, I, I'd officially. simply overstayed my visit. And they asked you to leave down there? Mm hmm. hmm. No sense of humour. Has it happened before? 
Sorry? Does it happen in other places? Or? No, 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 no I, I, I mean, I would like it to happen in other places. I, I, I'm, I, I'd like to go around the world getting a collection of these documents saying you've been asked to leave the country. Just want to be careful. <laughs> just want to put another score down. <laughs> <laughs> you can't tell you anything. Oh, I don't like the word gangster. It, it, it don't, it, it, I, I just can't take that. It's not, it's not like that. I feel embarrassed about it if someone was to say that, you know, and you see things portrayed now from Eastern about gangsters and all the rest of it. And it ain't like that. They're not like that. It's just a label stuck there. And uh, I, I totally disagree with it. I feel embarrassed when people use that word. I think, um, I'm afraid, I, I think that, that all life is ultimately about death. I mean, that's what I call the general contract. These are all failures. Uh, these are books I have been asked to find. Uh, and the people have not paid my prices. But um, what I intend to do with these is when the entire wall I is full, then I shall take them all uh, into a field uh, uh, and I shall invite all the people who asked me to look for the books and then I shall throw one book at a time onto the pyre and it will give me great pleasure. I'm very much in favour of burning books. And they are, after all, my books. Uh, and I feel that sort of burning books is a, a major contribution to civilization. Where is the best place to hide a book other than in a library? Where would you hide a book except in a library? On those floorboards? Like bodies. I don't hide bodies under floorboards, you know. But uh, nobody looks under floorboards. And I don't suggest, I would never suggest that a book is can having any influence on anybody by being seen or not seen. I think it's, it's too much of an ordinary everyday object and it has no magical content to it. The dead come back either loving you or hating you. It's a terrible thing when they hate you. You can't keep the dead out. They rest on your shoulder, whatever you're doing. They weigh nothing. The Baron, I've got it. It's just the key to the city, the Kabbalah, I've got it. How much do you want for it? What's the price? Um, each time after one of my marriages broke up, because I usually felt like a change of scene, and if I got no money, I could always go back to Blair and um, take out my own job back, because the night dispatcher was a you know, friend of mine. I only ever drove nights. Driving at night, you've got a much more interesting kind of client. Much more interesting. Sometimes they're downright dangerous. I had a knife in my back one night. Not in it, but I mean, just against it. And you look a bit stupid sitting in the steering wheel. Well, I mean, where the blokes in the back was. <laughs> well, you've got nowhere to go, really, have you? And except where you're told. When the twins had this, we'd always come over and pay our respects to them. That was the way it was. And uh, we had a drink that night. We discussed a couple of things. It was just a, a night out. Uh, we had two brothers with us over from West London who wanted to meet them. And uh, we'd said what we had to say and join our sort of cut of those and never want to, they want to go to the Regency Club in Stone Newton. We went to the flat in Everyone Road and, and, and that's what, what happened, the murder took place here. It's like walking in a dark alley and never knowing what's, what's there. I mean, it's just chance. 
It was put in his, his own car. In the, we tried to first of all get in the boot, but obviously we couldn't get in the boot. And he'd been wrapped and lighted down and placed in the back of the car, his own car. This is two tone, Mark II, Zodiac, I think it was. I was followed by two other men in another car, and I drove out of Everton Road down towards the Narrow Way Mayor Street. I come down the Narrow Way, and went down into Mayor Street itself, up to Cambridge Heath Road, up towards uh, across Commercial Road, and then to the Blackwall Tunnel. Within four or five hundred yards of me time in the tunnel, a police car had be coming the other way, which obviously made my heart skip a beat, but I knew he couldn't turn around. I mean, I, that was obviously, I put my foot down, and I lost the two men behind me deliberately. And I parked the car roughly about a quarter of a mile away from the entrance of the tunnel. This is on the south side of the river. The, the body was left there in the back of the, uh, the, the car. And uh, as I walked back onto the main road, I saw the two men circling, looking for me. I got in the car and we came back through the river. And that was the journey I took. The first novel I, I, I chose to write, the central character was um, a young Jew who came over as a child named Martin Stone. Martin Mad Dog Stone, he was called, but the Pink Fairies. I met Martin Stone um, a few times in the early 80s. Yeah. But yeah. they were into it in a much more intense way, um, the book dealing, you know, they did it too much. They went all over the country. Martin Stone certainly was legendary. Um, when I, he used to be one of my chauffeurs. Come 77, Martin Stone turned up on Stiff, on that, not the eighth single I think Stiff ever did, with the Pink Fairies, and that was it, Nada. This great improvising guitarist disappeared. I thought he was dead. Martin Stone, the, the, see the name definitely rings a bell. And then various rumours started reaching me across the channel that he'd actually was still alive and living in Paris and lost all his teeth. Well, anyway, you know, he's here. He, 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 he exists. This band that we all thought was dead, who was you know, one of the two great guitarists of the era, makes Clapton seem very boring and provincial. And here he is. This is Martin's whole vinyl collection in, in one shoulderful. Um, this was the first Savoy Brown LP. Now, he then, became, he then started going strange. There's a wonderful, wonderful photograph in there um, as a proto-hippie. And this has got some raga rock, which is pretty unusual for the time. But uh, here we come to Mighty Baby. What a wonderful sleeve that is. Absolutely wonderful. <laughs> There's a point where outside forces stop the game. And somehow, uh, apparently, although I never come back here anymore, uh, the game has been uh, has been annulled, you know. It's not there. This is what I'm told. And a quick visit to Bath Book Fair confirms that. Um, pity, pity. But perhaps we've already discovered everything. I'm not sure. I I I, I think not. Every generation throws up um, a, a number of people who perceive it almost as their duty to preserve in some way the past. And they're not necessarily by temperament archaeologists or museum directors. They're just people who temperamentally have a, some kind of wish to honor the past. Oi, have I got the things that are going to make you weep for pleasure? Oh, yes, OK. Stephen Blakesley. Well, we can only hope that he, a man called Stephen Blakesley won't show up and say, I wrote those. We'll never know, Drift. No, I don't do this anymore. And I've come a long way just for these, Drift. I'm sorry, but 
I'm really only interested in unique things, you know. Alvin Langdon Coben's copy. Initiates into occult societies. Books about death, funerals. A monoprint. Only one, one of one. Gavin Jones. Last year, 100 pounds. This year, 1,000 pounds. Two thousand years ago, Peru, death. that world has passed. Uh, it's a question of people knowing more about things. Everything has been discovered in a way, or at least priced. And so one is not really interested, or the greater world is not interested in you and what you have discovered. I'm sorry. <laughs> But I'm sure somewhere there is something that would set my heart afire once more. I, uh, I don't doubt it. Thank you. 